The topic is markets, banking, and of course, anything else that occurs to the panelists. But I'm going to pose a question for a start and hope that we will look at this because in the report, and going back to Ellen's slide, you'll see that we had significant advances in both water marketing and groundwater banking, both of which we feel are essential components to increase the flexibility. We live in the Mediterranean climate and there's plenty of other forms of uncertainty, but supply uncertainty will always be with us. And we have to have mechanisms, both infrastructure mechanisms and institutions mechanisms to take care of that. And markets and banking, both financial, have proved incredibly effective mechanisms in every other form of resource management. And so why not do more on water? And one of the things we noticed in Ellen's slide that she went over, if you remember the water trading slide, is that after a really promising start, we've leveled off. And so my first question to our three panelists is, what do they see as the two major impediments from their perspective of water markets? Why did we not see more market action in the 2009 drought that we were expecting? Uh, I'm going to start with Thad and, and then move on to Joan and then to Bill. You said, Thad, you're, you said you were going the other way, actually. So oh, I'm going to switch you around. Guard. Um, well, I guess if you, you want to talk about the 2009 Drought Water Bank, uh, we were one of the agencies that was heavily invested in that process. And, and I think if you want to take that as an example of uh, – it was a small success, but I think there was also a pretty big failure in terms of how that whole bank operated. And I think um, the two things that I would really focus on were, one, it, we had a very difficult time uh, in terms of getting um, an institutional structure put together where we had a lot of the water agencies that were participating in that effort. Uh, and that was on the north part of the state, central and southern part of the state. Uh, working with the agencies to try and get the proper environmental documentation done to actually get the transfer to happen. And we worked hard, and ultimately what ended up happening is the governor had to sign an emergency uh, declaration in order just to try and get that process through CEQA. Ultimately, that process was challenged in court, and there was a settlement resulting uh, from that process. So that was difficult. Um, the other thing was that... Uh, each year we, we try and work with the agencies also to have established set of rules of here are the guidelines of how transfer is going to work. Here's what water is transferable. Here's what water is not. Here's when it can be transferred. Here's when it can't. And we were also working up on those rules up until about the 23rd hour trying to get those done. And so I, I think really some of those two shows up is we were unprepared. And, um, and I think what we try to do since then is try and get to a process where we'd be better prepared. So when transfers come up, and really they come up every single year, we'd be ready to pull the trigger. And um, for this year, we're ready to pull the trigger? No. So um, you know, I think we still have a lot of work ahead of for ourselves and with the agencies. Joe. So um, what are the main barriers? Um, well, I guess, I guess I'll... I'll address what you brought up initially, which is why why does it appear as though water transfers have leveled off in the last, you know, uh, well, since 2000 or 2005 anyway. Um, I, I think one possibility also is the, is the development of banking. Uh, I know for our agency, we uh, participate in the Semi-Tropic Water Bank and have 350,000 acre feet of storage there. We had been filling that bank uh, in two, obviously 2006 was 100% allocation year, so we went, <clears throat> we went into the drought with relatively good storage there, and we were able to draw on that bank, and we did not participate so much in the water transfer market. Um, you know, our, our agency takes a um, kind of a portfolio, integrated portfolio approach to water supply reliability, which is very important to Silicon Valley. Um, so we, that portfolio includes banking, uh, doubling the amount of uh, conservation that we um, plan to do in the future. Currently, we conserve about 50,000 acre feet a year, um, doubling the amount of recycled water production. Um, we do rely on, on water transfers. We typically will do ha half a dozen up to half a dozen transfers a year. Um, 
And but generally speaking, when we, we're talking about future reliability, we're looking at either long-term transfer agreements or we're looking at uh, groundwater banking. So I, it may be that more um, uh, metropolitan and some of the other districts were able to rely more on their banking or their stored water that was filled in 2006 um, in the wetter years before the drought. But in terms of major obstacles, um, number one has got to be infrastructure. I, I agree with the conclusions of the report that infrastructure and, and the cumbersome approval processes are um, probably the biggest obstacles. So fixing the delta is key. Um, you know, for example, this year uh, the state water project allocation is 65 percent. Um, irrigation on the CVP is 40 percent. We're getting 75 percent of, of our M&I supply on the CVP. And um, we're being told also there is no capacity for transfer water through the delta this year. So instantly the uh, market shrinks to water that is already being exported south of the Delta under state and federal contracts primarily. That's the primary market. I mean, there are some independent water rights uh, south of the Delta, but um, so that becomes a real constraint in a year when you don't have capacity to move water through the Delta, but yet many people are still short of supply this year. Um, uh, the other thing is um, the amount of uncertainty that's created by lack of infrastructure uh, a lot of deals must be struck when um, we just don't know. We're talking to the willing sellers in the north. We don't know. We don't have a clue whether we'll be able to move that water through the delta that year. Uh, and this, you know, as a public water agency, um, if you're not careful about the commitments you make, you can buy water at $300 an acre foot and see it all go out the Golden Gate. Um, boards don't have a lot of tolerance for this. It's never happened to our agency. It's happened to others. Um, so it's, it becomes very risky if you don't have good ability to convey water. Uh, and then the approval processes, I, I think Thad has mentioned some of the factors on that. For Santa Clara Valley Water District, we're one of the only districts that is a contractor of both the state and federal projects. And people look at us and think, oh, you must have all kinds of flexibility to um, enter the water market and make deals and do things. And it is great most of the time. But what it really means is we have to learn two sets of um, rules about how water is moved. And um, these rules are pretty, and the policies of each project are very different. They're very complex. Um, and it doesn't always work out as, as uh, to be a big advantage necessarily. So I think those are some of the main uh, obstacles at the moment to you know, to a more robust market. And I would say that there is a lot of room for improvement in both the policies and the way um, our preparation for spot market transfers and our support um, by the agencies for long-term transfers. Yes, Bill. Um, well, I think that one of the differences between previous years and 2009 and what's got more difficult is the price of rice has gone up. Um, Frankly, there's less water available on the north coast, I mean in north of the delta, because the rice farmers are doing better. And if you look back the previous years, the rice farmers weren't doing so well, and it was economically, I mean, it made economic sense for them to transfer some water. So, I, I, you know, we're talking about markets here, and one of the fundamental things that you can't do is to forget the markets that everyone is involved in, and obviously the agricultural markets are a big part of that. Um, because I think in 2009, I mean, the demand was there. The demand was there from Kern County. Um, the demand, I don't think, had been very different from what it was previously. Um, but the price was higher. Um, the, as people have already said, the institutional barriers were, were much more difficult. Um, both in permitting and in infrastructure. And I think in general, you know, any, um, the further water is moved at the moment, the bigger the institutional barriers of getting permits and getting this and getting that. And if you're really talking about markets, you've got to talk about the degree of uncertainty and 
you know, I don't think markets work particularly well with an enormous degree of uncertainty. I mean, we're in the farming business. That's the risk business. We take all sorts of risks. We know what those risks are, so we know the parameters of it. When we're dealing with water at the moment and institutional um, permits or legal issues or anything else, there are no barriers. And that tremendous uncertainty, I believe, is making water transfers and everything else that we try and do with water at the moment far, far more difficult. Thank you. Um, Powell, uh, Joan mentioned um, the cumbersome approval process, and Thad applied to it, and, and, and Bill talked about institutional uncertainty. So, Joan, maybe you would lead off, because one of the recommendations in, in our report was for a programmatic environmental impact pro process uh, for pre-approval or s defining the criteria for pre-approval of trades under certain circumstances. And this would then theoretically speed up the, the, the process. So, Joan, if you could, my question is, what would be the essential characteristics of such a programmatic environmental impact review? Essential characteristics, well, um, there, there have been some examples of programmatic work uh, done. For example, south of Delta uh, federal transfers, there's programmatic NEPA documentation. And, and that has helped. I will say that it has helped facilitate the um, one-year transfers, the water management transfers that take place. Um, you know, I know the Bureau and um, Bureau of Reclamation and DWR have looked at programmatic transfers from north to south. And, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of a, a reluctance sometimes to um, jump into, into those because there was a discussion about litigation. You know, it's like walk, walking around and setting up a big bullseye, you know. Um, you know transfers are just very litigation prone. Uh, of course, with that said, you know, programmatic transfers, that's the conserve, it's the right thing to do, it's the conservative thing to do, it's just the pain and suffering of going through that process and then, um, you know, bearing the cost of, of any um, litigation that results from the whole thing. So, with that said, I, obviously any programmatic document really needs to focus on operations and change in the flow of water, how it can have uh, negative or positive effects on uh, flows for fish. It needs to um, look at cold water pool impacts on northern reservoir cold water pools for salmon and all of that. Um, water quality is another hot button issue typically. Um, delta water quality for, for Santa Clara, one of the things that we look at um, when we're looking at environmental documentation for transfers or, or new, new banking programs and that kind of thing is the impact on the storage levels in San Luis Reservoir since we uh, our district takes water out of the backside of San Luis when that reservoir gets too low, there's um, a very large potential for water quality impacts from algae. And so um, we look at changes to water quality from San Luis as well. And then um, if there are going to be any transfers related to groundwater substitution, then that's another key area that needs to be thoroughly um, addressed. And you know, that's best addressed really in a programmatic type of document. So um, those are some of the key elements. Good. Bill? Um, I think this is a question above my grade level. Um, Surely not. Um, pro yes, programmatic transfers is, is not something. But, but I just would say something about, you know, an awful lot of the focus of the discussion here is is sort of water transfers from north to south and through the delta. We shouldn't lose sight of how difficult it is to move water around. I mean, even in the southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, you know, we are fortunate enough to own property in various different water districts or places, and sometimes we need to move some of that water to somewhere else. And the number of, and we also have water in storage. And the, I mean, water, you know, is water. It all looks the same. But when it comes to transferring it, um, I, you know, the, in, um, 
you know, in, in business we talk about how many SKUs you've got. And I, do you all know what a SKU is? Okay. If you have ten different flavors of pistachios that you're selling, right, each one has a different SKU, and each size has a different SKU. So it's like the number of items that you have in inventory, right? Different sizes, different qualities, different things. And we end up with a water inventory that is sort of extraordinary about what can be used where, what can be moved where, who can move it through what. And it's the most Byzantine process. Um, and that's before um, getting into things like programmatic environmental impact. Things. I mean, the whole thing is so dysfunctional um, at every level um, that it's really hard to talk about marketing in a dysfunctional environment, and that's really what we're facing. Dad, do you want to add some, some cheerful uh, comments? To, uh... <laughs> I'm so encouraged about my job right now. It's lovely. <laughs> Um, well, I think really it goes back to the gentleman asked a question, I think, right off the bat about excess water and how much is there really. And I think the answer really is there's no ex excess water. We're using all the water in the state for beneficial purposes, for the environment, for M&Is, for agriculture. It's a question of how are we managing our water. And really transfers are, in my mind, a remanagement of that supply for other purposes. And, you know, we transfer water in a state all the time. I mean, every project that's built is transferring water. We transfer probably 30 to 40 million acre feet a year through facilities. We don't call them transfers, but water is being transferred. And so what we're talking about here is really an incremental amount of water on top of that. And I think figure eight has in the, in the manual here talks about maybe between one to two million acre feet on top of that. And we're, we're talking about what are the impacts or how are we going to put that water to different uses than it otherwise would have. I mean, really, that's the definition, I think, of the transfer that we're talking about here. And we've talked about these programmatic documents or environmental um, documents that are required to transfers because there are questions by the public to make sure that when you do a transfer, you're not injuring another user. And I think that's the primary purpose why we do it, either from a state side and under CEQA or a federal side under NEPA. And some of the questions that have to get asked, especially for our agency today, is well, why would you ever want to show that you have water to transfer to begin with? Because there's somebody in the state or in the feds who just say, well, if you have extra water, we're just going to take it. We're not going to let you transfer it. That's not right. It's not fair. We're just going to take it. So immediately you have the issue of, well, why should I even go into an environmental document or go out to the public and say we may want to do a transfer? Because it, you, it, you've, you become at risk immediately of – Looking at somebody looking at what assets you have. But I think going um, beyond that, I, you know, for our agency, we, we live in open space. I like to drive my 65 Ford, Ford Fairline through the country. It's great. Um, and it's beautiful, but we want to make sure we do transfers. We're protecting our open space, our environment, our communities. And the environmental document is, is a sure way that we can get information out to the public to demonstrate that we are doing things that are – in the interest of our own constituents, you know, we're protecting our constituents first, but also the folks around us, and that's vitally important, whether it's for fallowing or, or groundwater transfers. And I guess maybe to touch on that a little bit is, um, you know, when you transfer, you have to specify how you're making water available. And really there's only a couple of ways that we do it, at least in this part of the region, is either it's you take land out of production, and when you do that, there's usually, there could be an effect from doing that, and you have to acknowledge what that effect is and make sure you mitigate it for it. Same thing with groundwater. So, um, you know, I think that's critical. And just to give you an example of this year, um, um, and one of the other things I want to say is um, transfers are great, but they're not proven yet. We have not hit a hard drought in the last 15 years. We've had a couple scares the last three or four years, but we've been bailed out. I think we're in big trouble. I'm going to say that right now. I mean, because we have not had a sustained drought. And when we do, I mean, the wheels are going to fall off the bus. But that's a different story. Um, <clears throat> I would just, I'd just like to sort of add to that. And, and I think, honestly, that um, all the um, numerous authors in the PPIC report got it wrong. 
I don't think we got through the drought. I don't think we got through the drought. My fear is that not that we're using all the water of the states beneficially, is that we're using more than the water of the state beneficially. Um, the fact that we came through the drought with no, um, this last drought with very few outward signs of damage um, is like sort of coming through a recession and you still maintained having a car in your driveway and your house hasn't fallen apart. Um, so you've got the outward appearance of having survived, but then you've moved up, you've used up all your savings accounts. Um, and I think that that's what we're doing. Um, I think we're, one of the big problems that we're not facing up to at any level is that we're using more water in the state than we have. And, um, you know, we're sort of doing the same as the politicians have done to us on pensions and health care reform for people. We're spending money that we don't have. And it's going to catch up with us. Um, mo mo moving on then. Um, with <laughs> to, boy, this is, a, this, is, this is a down hour. Where, where, yeah. where are we getting I, these, I, I, these, I, these I, remarks I, about yeah. sex and stuff? I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, let's, let's think about Another cheerful topic that <laughs> the politicians like to talk about, banking. But um, let's talk about water banking, specifically groundwater banking, because the previous panel stressed the need for storage. It didn't say what type of storage. But, of course, the potential for groundwater banking is one of the few forms of storage we're making more of every year um, w w without environmental impacts uh, being filed. So um, I, I would like to lead off with, with Bill's comments since he's been involved, rumor has it, with um, groundwater banking in a certain way, and, uh, and then move back down through, through Joan and Thad. So Bill, would you move off? And, and the question is, how can we encourage local agencies to modify their, their uh, restrictions or encourage more groundwater banking? Okay. Um. But first, I want to go back to your comment where you said without environmental consequences. I think that some of the water banking that's taking place in California has tremendous environmental um, benefits. Um, slightly in my surprise, or perhaps because we didn't think of it, that you know, the Kern Water Bank, which I have a minor role in, is now one of the sort of best privately controlled environmental um, bird sanctuaries when we have water in the winter in the state. I mean, what you can do with these things is astounding. We had you know, more than 3,000 white pelicans this year, 35,000 birds. So it's not no environmental harm. It's actually environmental benefit, and it's one of the few things that you can say in water that you do something and it actually helps. You can be perceived to be doing good environmentally. So after that sort of dislocating my shoulder, um, I, there's two things about water banking that bother me a little bit. One is that although we have been relatively successful, I sometimes worry if it's not oversold because I, I worry that there are the um, physical fact, the physical geology in place to really allow it to happen in many places. And, and frankly, I don't know who's really looked up and down the state, but you know, there are places in Kern County where we could do more, um, but it's, you know, it's not necessarily easy and the ideal places to do water banking have probably been used for that purpose right now. So I, I sort of worry is, is it's, oh yes, if we did more water banking, we'd be okay, but it's not easy to do it. It's, it's hard to find the right place to do it well. Um, I would just say that the other thing about water banking um, that it would be, that I think would encourage some people a little bit is that, you know, if you're water banking in a 
groundwater basin where you are not the sole um, occupant of the groundwater basin and the groundwater basin is not in balance, um, you're increasing your level of uncertainty and you're increasing the likelihood of minor warfare with your neighbors. Um, so I'm all for water banking. I think it's the greatest thing, and I, I do think that there are areas in, well, certainly, I mean, my knowledge is mostly Kern County, but there are not, there are, there's a lot of space for doing a lot more water banking, but it's not as easy as people make out, and it's very difficult to do water banking unless you have excess water, which means getting it out of the, right? So yeah. that's the other yeah. Uh, I guess um, uh, I, I guess I don't have quite as gloomy of a view of water transfers or water banking as Bill. <laughs> but um, you know, I do think uh, he, Bill made a very good point about the multiple benefits of, of groundwater banking. That there is um, some compatibility there with environmental management. Um, clearly, you can minimize the amount of surface water storage um, working in conjunction with groundwater banking to, to manage um, the wet years and for, to meet dry year needs. Um, I guess, you know, what does it depend on though? It does depend on conveyance. Again, you have to be able to get the water to the bank. Uh, you have to be able to convey the water out of the bank to the people who need, need it. Um, one of the interesting things about flexibility in banking is that um, we, we tend to use it um, for our own needs, but we've also used it as a way to uh, um, generate revenue. For example, in 2009, we actually sold water from the Semi-Tropic Water Bank to an ag district in Kern County um, to be used for permanent crops. That generated revenue for us to um, put into our water use reduction campaign in Santa Clara County. So it, it's kind of got some flexibility there. We've used it. Um, to help support refuge deliveries. So I think that's, that's a key thing. Um, I wanted to talk about state and federal governments supporting water banking. Uh, well, number one, local control is very important. That's the key thing. Uh, so whatever role the state, state government or the feds have, really the locals have to be in charge. In terms of potential impacts on the neighbors, um, because most, most places aren't like Santa Clara County where the overlying water, groundwater management agency over, you know, manages that basin. There's typically um, multiple jurisdictions above it. Um, it's very important to have comprehensive groundwater modeling and support. It takes years, absolutely years, to um, develop the mo modeling, the monitoring, the um, operating agreements so that people do feel comfortable with the operating rules for a bank. Um, so that's, those, those are key, key things, and I think the state and federal government um, can perhaps help support some of those development efforts where it's, where it's appropriate. Um, they can also, looking ahead, I think they can play a role in strategic planning. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about climate change, and so as climate changes, groundwater banking will become you need to have that right balance between surface water storage and, and your surface water system and your groundwater banking system in order to really optimize. So if water supply is coming uh, more in the form of rainfall, it's splashier, more variation, you have to have the ability to capture and manage that wet your water and get it into your bank. And that is probably an area where uh, there could be a role for state and federal government to support um, groundwater banking. It's really, I think Javier on the last panel mentioned a stable planning environment. I mean, I think they can, they can have a role in helping to provide that. But the bottom line is the banks themselves have to have, be, um, have a proponent locally and they have to be uh, a local program. I also think it's fair to note that I think at least most of the water banks that I know of have been done um, in spite of um, federal and state. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with yeah. that. It, 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 there's been no encouragement. In fact, there's been 
hurdles to get through, um, and it's been done in spite of that. So, um, you know, maybe one way they could help is just not hinder. Bad. do you have something to add to that? Well, I mean, I didn't get to finish up my last comment on the, the environmental documentation. I think it just, the other thing that was important was it allows us to, like I said, disclose to the public and get ahead of the curve. I mean, we have sophisticated groundwater models for the Sacramento Valley. We've done a lot of things to make sure we understand the impacts to um, wildlife and everything. And I think, you know, everything is connected. I think one of the things that we've learned about transfers that we didn't know about the last drought particularly in the early 90s, is how interconnected the systems are. Surface water is connected to groundwater, which is connected to streams, creeks, uh, which is connected to habitat. And you have to make sure you have a good, solid understanding of all that. And I have to say that I think we've only in the last probably five years really got a hold of that understanding. So to me, it's pretty exciting because now we can go out and say, yeah, here's what we want to do and have a better understanding or a really good understanding of how transfers could benefit, but also how they could cause impacts and making sure we're addressing those. Um, on, on banking, I, I just want to talk about another encouraging um, program we've been doing in Sacramento Valley is, is that we, we actually did look at traditional groundwater banking like they do down in Kern County where you have a groundwater bank, you take water out of storage or extra water, you put it in a bank, you pump it back out and it's available for other purposes. Um, in Sacramento Valley, our, our, our uh, groundwater aquifers are, are typically full. We have very few cones of depressions throughout the valley, and so sort of this take water in or, or put water in and take it out after the fact just doesn't work in the Sacramento Valley. So we actually partnered up uh, our district with uh, the Natural Heritage Institute, which is an environmental group uh, based out of the Bay Area, and uh, Greg Thomas is leader of that organization, and we worked on a project, and, and we actually came up with a, a different uh, approach and what we've looked at is really looking at reservoir reoperation uh, to get more yield out of the projects and you actually use groundwater to back up or to put in a backstop for any operations that uh, didn't really come out the way you thought. So as an example, what we've done is we modeled um, eight out of ten years if you look at how the projects are operated, water is released when it wouldn't need to be released. So the, the, the operators are taking uh, being overly um, safe in their operations because they want to avoid risk. They're risk adverse like most people are. And, but at, when they do that, they actually release more water than they need, need to. And what we said is, look, be, more, be riskier with your operations. And when you, when you do that, you actually free up more water for other purposes, beneficial purposes for the environment, for water supply. If you then make a decision where you've essentially released more water than what the system was backfilled in, we can make water, groundwater available to fill up that hole. So really, instead of pumping and doing this, you're putting water in and out every single year, using energy to do all that stuff, you're basically using the reservoir to its fullest operation, and you're only using groundwater in the times you need it. And what we've seen is that has significant benefit uh, for both the, the ecosystem and the environment. And I, I know the state right now is also looking at this uh, reoperation study, and we believe some of the work we've done up in the Sacramento, Sacramento Valley is, could be a basis for that. But um, our report's available on our website if you want to download it. And uh, it's very interesting, and, and also we're always looking forward to uh, try and move that program forward. But we feel it's a way that we can generate more supply while being less dependent on the groundwater. And especially in our region, we have a lot of our areas dependent on groundwater. We want to make sure we minimize impacts to other users. Thanks. Um, that's really good. We've got a few minutes left in, in this session, so uh, if I might throw it open to the floor, and if uh, anyone has any questions, jokes, whatever, um, let's take them. Yes, right here. If you would announce your name, um, I think there's a mic coming. Okay. Mark Bradley with uh, Delta Stewardship Council. Water in California, on, on the one hand, we have a water right system that's a, a usurpatory system. It's the right to use a resource held in, in common ownership. Um, and we're talking about the concept of water banking, water marketing, water transfer, which suggests kind of a, a, a commodity that's held at that point. 
How do you reconcile those two? How do you, how do you move forward with a dynamic system that lets you move water around while you have this system that is based on that's based on just the right to use that water at a certain point in time and under certain conditions? How do you reconcile those two, and what needs to change on either end? Well, I mean, that's why I was kind of saying uh, that you're not changing the right, you're changing the use. So when we have a right to use water, if we're going to fallow land and make that water available for a transfer, we're using that right as if that land would have been farmed. So, I mean, it, you're not, yeah. you're talking about the same thing, but again, that's why there's really no extra water. You're always changing about how you're changing uses, and those uses have to be consistent with the water, water right system in California. Yeah, it, I mean, it is a transfer of water to somebody else to use. They're still using that water. You're allowing them to use it under your right. So, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, water banking and, and transfers and, and things like that, I mean, there's a, a certain amount of investment that's needed, you know. So I guess one the way I'm looking at it also, uh, the transfer market is, for example, we've we purchased water from ag districts who've then taken that revenue and gone out to put fish screens on the San Joaquin River on their intakes. You know, that revenue then becomes, it multiplies into other benefits for society at large. So, you know, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, it encourages investment where it's needed. And, um, you know, I think it works fine, frankly. Bill, you have I don't know. Um, other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with a question about water marketing that I asked earlier. And uh, it seems that on page uh, 17 of the report, it shows uh, a spike uh, from the mid-80s to current levels that have run, uh, leveled off. I'm wondering uh, if the panel could answer why we're seeing this leveling off and have the markets been saturated? Give a little bit of an explanation on that little marketing strategy and ex explanation. Thank you. Bill, do you want well, to Well, I don't think the market has been saturated any way at all. I think it's fallen off. Um, well, partly because I suspect that in some of those earlier years there was also, um, I can't remember the environmental water accounts and things like that yeah. that went into it. Um, I mean, I, it's not getting any easier, um, but I don't think that the demand is down. Um, in fact, I think the demand is up. And, you know, I agree with the general tenet of the report that we should be doing more water marketing. I think that the problem is, is that markets only work in a relatively well-structured environment. And at the moment, we don't have a well-enough-structured environment for the market to work properly. No one knows the rules. No one knows who's on, who's doing what, and it's very difficult to get a market oh, to work under this. I, I, I would have to say, I think there are a lot of rules. <laughs> Maybe too <laughs> many rules, but yeah. no one knows which uh, rule is an ascendancy yeah, I, I, on I this think, day. I think the main uncertainty is really, um, for example, if you are doing a long-term transfer and you're going to do a 20-year transfer of some kind, the reliability of the supply under that right, under that contract, is what's what's you know that that transfer is always going to be subject to environmental rules and environmental limitations and so that's the uncertainty that's there under the under the water rights but but, um, but but I just would like to add something like that I think that one of the interesting things about the initial presentation or the rest of it is that everyone can speculate or can do their own calculations about how much water is needed in California, how much water, what we can do with water, where we need it. But the enormous unknown through all this is how much water is the environment going to need or take or thing, right? There was the one on, there was one slide that was, was, was put up earlier that, you know, one of the things that we all know is that the environment is going to want more water. Well, I think one of the questions is how much and how do we sort of calculate it? Um, it's, it's, it's an enormous uncertainty, and I think something that really has to be, I think there needs to be some sort of level or understanding of how much it's going to be, and I don't think it can be as limitless as it is apparently at the moment. 
I mean, I, I guess. Want to add a few. Yeah, yeah I mean, just kind of maybe give another uh, ag perspective, at least in our area. I know, and if you look at Figure Four, I think the other thing you see is, I mean, ag, ag demands are down, ag use is down. So, I mean, the, first of all, the question is, if you're if agriculture is using less water, it was historically the place you went to get water. So, if it's using less water, what do you do? It's using less water. Those demands have also hardened up. So you have either through crop changes, going to more orchards, permanent crops, higher value crops, that water is now, you need that water year in, year out. Um, and then you also just have, you know, agencies, you know, parts of our region that have gotten more efficient and we can't transfer that water. That water, if you become more efficient in the Sacramento Valley, you don't get to transfer that. That water is available now to the next user downstream of you or to the next junior water right holder. So we spent all a bunch of money, we spent a bunch of money um, be more efficient and we get nice thank you letters, but that's about all we get. We don't get money. We don't get to transfer that water. So that's just one of the benefits of being in our region. So, I mean, I, I just think that, um, thank you, you're welcome <laughs> because, uh, because of that, I, I just think that there's just not going to be that much water available on an annual basis to transfer. I mean, growers are risk adverse, so they're not going to take risks to try and go out and transfer water. And then the other thing that we've seen, well, two things. One is, um, there's a big generational shift in agriculture, and that's probably you don't hear a lot about, but you basically have um, kids taking over parents' operations, and so their philosophy is a lot different than what their parents did, and that's just something that's there. It's hard to explain, but I'll tell you it's there. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, I think you have um, the issue where growers, farmers have made a lot more investments in their operations. So you don't have just a farmer now just farming a piece of ground. He's a member of a co-op. He's a member of an operation, a processing operation, things like that. Well, once you get invested in those types of multi-level operations, you have to run a product through all that, else those operations lose money and go out of business. And so you have a lot of growers who may have said, oh, I'm going to do a transfer, I'll do this, I'll do that. Now they're saying, no, I am multi-invested in different companies through the product I grow and they no, no longer have the luxury to say I'm going to put my water on the market because that water now is not just making them money it's making their trucks money it's making their processing money it's making their wholesaler who's selling out of this country now on the internet money so the market the market of commodities has made the water market a lot more complicated we have to wrap it up there I'd like to thank the panel they've been insightful knowledgeable if not cheerful <laughs>